What are the markets telling you? What are you seeing? The housing market, but also then the storage market, the debt that we're seeing and the pricing of that debt. We had this huge, crazy, I don't know if we'd want to call it a black swan event, but we had this semi black swan event take place. And then the interest rates. So we had just like this perfect storm of multiple factors hitting all at the same time. The swing from going from 3% or sub <laughs> to eight destroyed the buying power completely. Welcome to Self Storage Income, everybody. And uh, today we are so excited to have Ben back with us to do like an end of the year wrap up of the financial markets. As we know, um, it has been a crazy 2023 and uh, the debt markets have been unpredictable. Um, and that's that made it hard for everybody and planning. So we want to take a look at where we've been, right? Kind of how we got here now and how is this year settling out and what that may mean towards the future. That has a lot to do with planning, obviously, uh, both cap rates as well as uh, cash flow operations are affected by debt, our debt stack, how we're placing it, how we're constructing it. It's the difference between buying deals and not. It's the difference between exiting at what you were planning on and not. So it's a really, really big deal that's changed the markets more than anything um, in the last year. So thanks for coming on, Ben. Appreciate having you. Glad to be here. Thanks, guys. Yeah, we got, you know, um, it's been really boring for the last decade. It's like, oh, interest rates just go down, they stay down, and uh, free money all around. <laughs> everybody's winning. That's right. Everybody's <laughs> winning. Everybody, free money for everybody. That's not quite the environment we have today, is it? No, it's uh, it's it's been an interesting year, uh, to, to say the least. So, um, and it came at a pace that... Uh, put a lot of us on the back foot, right? So um, everybody, you know, all sort of buckets of capital, especially for us in the self-storage sphere that that we utilize, it, it, it moved quicker than say the transaction volumes could adjust for and buyers and sellers were able to adjust for that. So hence, you know, a lot of the gridlock in the, uh, in the acquisition market, but you know, it's with, with the indices widening out over the last 18 months and, um, you know, minus the last few weeks here, there's been some downward pressure, but, uh, it, it's really, yeah, it's had some dramatic impact on, you know, not just self storage and what's happening with us, but across other asset types as well. So, and you know, this is really, uh, yeah, just even just thinking back what you said, the, the speed at which it happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were under contract on a massive portfolio that we really wanted to buy. And during the due diligence time, interest rates doubled. I mean, we were shocked by it. It was it was so big and such a wide ranging change so quickly, which we were under the impression that rates were going up. We'd been saying that for a long time. I mean, but the speed at which it happened was wild, to say the least. And that I, having time to adjust, like you mentioned, nobody did. Right. It, it just was immediately like we had to walk away from the deal. We're looking at this going, we don't even know. We we entered into a new world from when we went under contract to today, and we don't even know what that looks like. And I think that caught a lot of people, us, every, it caught everybody. There's nobody that knew or, or thought that it would. And um, that really changed the game. And why don't you talk a little bit about the effects that that has on not just the market, but individual deals and assets. So what were the changes that occurred and then two, as you mentioned, it stayed up. So this it wasn't short term thing, right? It's maintained up there. And so what what did that affect? How did it affect our industry, the owners, right? Uh, what was the repercussions of that? So this uh, this really started towards the um, uh, the you know it was about 12 18 months ago when when interest rates really started to to increase with um, the Federal Reserve I increasing federal funds rates um, and this you know this this really impacts 
this this is just uh, impacts sort of all directions of our business and what we're doing, right? Um, when interest rates uh, increase, it obviously increases the borrowing costs, which in, impacts our bottom line. It impacts uh, the prices that we're able to pay. Um, <clears throat> it impacts the uh, the return on all of our investments. It impacts um, housing prices, which impacts moving, which impacts self-storage. So it's not just a direct on a deal that we buy, it's sort of the external factors that impact our business, right? As interest rates increase, it, it, it lowers discretionary spending. So people have to make decisions about what they're doing with their money, what they're storing, do they need, where can they cut? Um, and then that impacts our business. Um, so there's, you know, it's uh, the, the core side of it is, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's what's our bottom line. Um, if we are buying into uh, into an, an interest rate increasing environment, right? If we're buying into it or we're refinancing into it, some of our transactions we've been fortunate enough to to have uh, put fixed rate loans on prior to with more longer duration, so we weren't caught on it on some of those deals. But other ones that we've looked at in this environment, looking at hey, what what can we pay for this, and how much how much leverage can we get, right? And how much equity do we need to raise? And how does that impact our returns, right? The cost of borrowing versus the cost of uh, of equity investments, right? So it's 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 the asset itself, but then you also have the external factors that impact self storage as well that that have um, that have you know had headwinds with with increasing rates. So yeah, um, that's that's a really good way to look at it, but also to distinguish it. There, There is the asset, meaning the tradable asset is the market of storage, right? That we look at and the impacts of that, which obviously we talk a lot about, but then there is the uh, um, intrinsic part of it, which is the actual business and the customers and the operating, and they were both hit. So the, you know, as we, we talked about everybody, self-storage benefits from movement. The number one thing that got hit with rising interest rates, and especially that quickly, was real estate, and that meaning the housing market. And the swing from going from 3% or sub to 8 um, it destroyed the buying power completely for the market, and it also trapped people, so it created stagnation. That changes our customers. Um, well, it changes the customers. It also changes the ones that we do have need utilization. How many are in the marketplace and what's going on? So it was coming into because of fall of last year when we saw the spike, right? Coming in, especially then to the busy season, it was that open thing like, okay, we know how the asset got hit. We saw that pullback. Now we're going to see how kind of the dust settles, but it was both sides. And that landscape, that new landscape left for a lot of open-ended questions. What will this look like and how will this play out? And some markets it affected differently than others, but universally, they, we were hit intrinsically and extrinsically. Yeah, and to to you know to just elaborate on a point that you made there, right? When during this increase in interest rates, um, with the expectation potentially that with the with that rise, maybe home prices would decline, there was more of this lack of supply on the market for homes because you know candidly, someone like myself, right? I, I'm in a very low interest rate home that I live in now, and I don't want to buy into more than yeah. two times what, what my rate is today. So I said, I'm, I'm fine here. But because of that lack of supply, the, the, the prices of homes went up. And so you're buying into in some of these markets, right? Yeah. So that really stopped that mobility and the, the, the home, you know, the, the home movement, which is a, a massive driver of our business. So it is. And we've definitely seen it. I mean, the busy season, like we've seen across the board, just didn't hit this year like it's hit in the years yeah. previous. Um, and that, that did take a huge toll on it. And, and really good point there, Ben. Um, and the other thing that I think about, too, as you guys are talking about this, is that that 
that unprecedented event that we'd never seen before with inflation, with stimmy checks, with all the things that were happening and in coordination with this increase in interest rates. So it was like we had this huge, crazy, I don't know if we'd want to call it a black swan event, but we had this semi black swan event take place. And then the interest rates. So we had just like this perfect storm of multiple factors hitting all at the same time. And then those interest rate hikes trying to make up for all of that, you know, issues that we'd had, you know, previously. But um, no, it's been been an interesting 2023 for sure. And that that movement, the, the housing issue has really, really impacted the storage industry in a huge way for yeah. sure. Now, when you look at those impacts, both obviously intrinsic and extrinsic, um, at some point, because I mean, even looking at housing, right? At, at, the what should have happened was interest rates should have gone up that meant your purchasing power was eroded away so the price of the asset should have adjusted to entice obviously Mm -hmm. though the due supply that didn't happen right um and but we still people still need first of all housing people still have to move on with life right so it's okay it's changing that outlook and maybe at the volumes or how how that works, but what do you think as of this this telling? Because we we've seen a change in the fourth quarter. Now, what that really actually means or not, largely being driven by inflation dropping. Correct. So yeah. when we look at how we're ending up this year, what are the markets telling you? What are you seeing? Both for let's say the housing market, but also then the storage market, the debt that we're seeing and the pricing of that debt as we are now leading out of this year and headed into the next year, especially versus how we started. When you guys are looking at property management software for your storage facilities, there's a ton of options out there, but no other option compares to Tenant Inc. Tenant Inc. is gonna be your one-stop shop solution that has an amazing amount of tools that you can deploy at your fingertips to maximize the value of your facility, to operate it more efficiently, more effectively. They have an open API where you can back in almost anything you want, you own your data, and it's just an incredible solution. I can't say enough good things about these guys. Link is in the show notes. Be sure to check out Tenant Inc. Hey, podcast listener. Are you looking at buying your first storage facility, but you're not confident in your numbers or don't know what risks may lie? Well, we actually do feasibility studies for storage facilities that you can even provide to your bank. We do the underwriting, we look at the market, we tell you where the upside is and the risks so you can move forward in confidence and have a business plan so day one, when you buy that facility, you know what it's worth and what you need to do. If you wanna learn more about our feasibility studies follow the link in the show notes a lot of questions mm-hmm. there a lot nope. of good ones um no pressure yeah nope. i wish <laughs> okay. I, I wish i had a, all the answers accurate, i wish i had an accurate crystal wall but i'll i'll, I'll do the best that i can uh it, it seems from from the from the the movements in the markets the, uh, and uh the projections of interest rates it seems like we've we've sort of come to this point recently where you know hikes knock on wood have stopped, which is obviously good for our business. Um, so hopefully that, you know, we can keep I, the, you know, I, I've said this before, but the volatility is what just eviscerates our business yep. and not knowing what what's going to happen is just, uh, it just causes everything to come to a screeching halt, right? So if there is clarity, that is much appreciated. And it seems like there there is a little bit of pocket here because you know, this last year, it's almost as if everybody hangs on to every little thread of data and then the markets sort of move at like a, uh, you know, more amplified rate just based yeah. on everything. You know, the other day there was CPI data and PPI data that came out and then uh, treasuries, you know, the tenure was moving a, a double digit swing, right? Just based on the, Connor, the mentioned that inflation data is coming down, right? So that all that is, uh, you know, hopefully it gives us some some idea and some look into there being some uh, some, you know, some basis for interest rates on a go forward basis and potentially, you know, some maybe even some cuts into the future. I, again, yeah, we don't it, know. We don't know. Yeah. But that's obviously. But it's a the hope. different sentiment from especially last year at this time, which, by the way, too, um, I, I, I personally we're not planning for all of a sudden interest rates to be cut or anything else like that, because it, it hasn't happened. We think that the market you will know, be soft, but it's not like we said, oh yeah, we're gonna get, interest rates are gonna drop back down to what they were. And that's not what I'm saying at all. Not, but I do feel that there's a different sentiment today than there has been 
especially from August prior and uh, the for going into this year where, like you said, it's not so much that it's either high or not, but it's the known, right? Because prior, it was like, we could keep going. We could go from 8 to 10 to 11 to 12, 15. Who knows where the ceiling is on this? And so I, I agree with you. A little clarity, and at least we just know a range, meaning that, all right, we've seen maybe the hikes we're going to see because inflation is down, right? We're in this. doesn't mean interest rates are going to drop or go back to normal or anything else, but it may soften a little, right? Sure. But it, it, just knowing, though, that they're not going to go up, that's a big change. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's helpful. And I think with with this as well, it it I, over the last year, you've seen folks make uh, executive decisions to enter markets or exit markets and pause and you know maybe hey we're not going to do uh, this type of debt or we're going to focus on another type. So I think it allows. Um, the, the, the credit side of the business to to figure out where their their lanes are for for 2024 and maybe some folks are saying hey you know we have a lot rolling off the books because of our construction portfolio our uh, our bridge portfolio and I think that is an, an area that's going to be interesting right especially some of those folks who on the storage front focusing here on the storage front particularly who who went into the ground say 12 18 months ago or bought 12, 18 months ago with the expectation that rental rates, you know, Connor, you've, you're have you obviously on the front end of, of rental rates in some of these markets, but, um, you know, uh, buying into these markets where, where their loans are coming due for refinance, uh, especially the construction folks who yeah. were pro forma-ing some, you know, some level that is not achievable. Yeah. So the question mm -hmm. is, are they going to sell? Are they going to cash in refi? Are they, you know, I, I, it, it's difficult to say. I, it's, it's, it feels like this market is not maybe global financial crisis where yeah. equity was absolutely eviscerated. It, yeah. Especially it feels like from, you know, there's asset types in, you know, very specific that I, you know, office for instance, has had a huge hit. But when we talk about storage, even if cap rates have, have widened and rental rates have come in, it doesn't feel as if 60% leverage 18 months ago, even 24 months ago is going to be 100% leverage today. Yeah. Not not across the board. Yeah. Maybe it's 80%, right? Yeah. If, the, if that's coming due, right? Yeah. So there's still equity in there yep. for the lender. So they're not potentially getting wiped out. I think that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out in, in our side of the business over the next year. There could be some potential buying opportunities there? I agree. And I'm not seeing that. We're not seeing that. We're not seeing people that own cash flowing existing assets are wiped out. Even though occupancies are down, rents are down. We're not, it's not having, Drew, we- Street rates. Yeah, street, street rates. rates. Yeah. Excuse me. That's a very important distinction. Street rates versus in-place rates. Meaning, <laughs> um, and we were looking even at the REIT data, right, where they're, they're, they're still up in revenue. Now, it's small, but they are, right? And even for us, we look at our revenues up, even though in our markets, as we were measuring, those street rates were, were down. So those are different in, in our industry. And, but when we look at the deals that are coming to the market that were built on the projections of two years ago, sure. that is very different because you're building at something, a level that has now gone down at 30%. That means every single new customer you get is immediately 30% lower than what you projected. That also means that your cost basis is wildly larger uh, because you're moving into that new, new debt structure at that higher interest rate. And then you have to sit down and say, we assumed when we were building it that we were building at a loan to value, right, of whatever, 60, 40, or whatever that may have been, right, 70, 30, that when we got it out of the ground and at pro forma. Well, on those numbers, that may that that may have been true. But now that it's done and you're ready to go into a perm loan and you got to fill that thing up and rates are down 20%, what does that value look like now? What do you think and what have you seen lenders 
do or try to do in situations where the cost and revenue projections that we loaned on for construction loans and everything are not going to be that at perm. What do you think happens to that for people that are like, I don't, I don't, what happens there? I don't even know. Yeah, as it's a, it's a, it's a great question, and there's really no uh, one size fits all for it. What I always say, and what's generally a good, great rule of thumb, is to get in front of this. You know, the the just as much as th- this is a partnership with your with your lender, and be it a construction loan or, and I'm assuming in this context, yeah, we're yes. talking about not a merchant build, yes, right. So right, so this is one that's a legacy hold for the long term. Yep, it, it's for. I am always an advocate of, of getting in front of these things because yes. that way, at least you're proactive. The lender can appreciate that. They sense that you're you're an active participant in this and you're not play, trying to play any you know games per se for lack of a better ex- expression um you know getting in front of it some of this uh, some of this could boil down a, a few different ways hey maybe they'll extend the io period a little bit longer maybe you need to right size the deal you can come in with a little bit more cash uh that's that's always you know yeah. some challenge you know maybe you got to sell it Maybe you yeah. need to go back out to market and get a, a prep equity piece or some other form of, of of equity slice to 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 get you to where it needs to be to right size the deal. You know, you should uh, be exploring those options absolutely and exploring them with the lender. I was going to say this yeah. is a really good talking point because they they were talking a little bit about this exact thing at the, the Idaho SSA event you know, just several weeks ago. And one of the uh, Collier's representatives was sharing with the team and the group there that um, he had been asking lenders actively, like, in that event, what would you guys do? And he said there was no just across the board, like, yeah. this is what every lender is going to do. It was really the lender was exactly like what you were saying, Ben. Oh, well, well, we'll sell it or we'll do this or we'll do that. Like, there was just no, it was just really up to the lender. There was no just one size fits all answer to it. Yeah. Yeah. Some of these are for sales, yeah. right? So some of them might be, hey, the best option here is to sell, especially if you can, you can, you know, like I said, that's sixty to eighty percent. So maybe you're not, whatever it may be, right? At least you're getting out of your deal and you're getting a little bit of the money back. It yeah. wasn't, hey, the the appraised the appraised value at construction is not where it is now. So you know, you didn't make as much money. Yeah. You you live to fight another day, yeah. and you're not you're not upside down. So you know there's there's some strategy to be to be thought of with that, or you know you can have another partner buy in. There's there there's a multitude of different ways to go about this. But I, I'm uh, I'm I, I would very much say it's it's important to to be proactive in this regard well, rather than waiting. And we're in a good market where that's actually possible because in 2008 that was impossible. There weren't those options, right? First of all, there wasn't a market to buy. Right. There also, equity was gone, evaporated. Nobody was coming in and placing capital. Uh, There was no pref equity, right? Things like that. That's not this market. It's not. We don't see it. We're buyers. Other people are buyers, right? And um, that's a really important distinction to make uh, that at this point in the market, we don't just see fire sale deals coming onto the market. We haven't seen them, right? And if they are coming onto the market, there is liquidity. There are buyers that are buying today, right? There's lots of buyers that are actually buying today. It may not be at what you want, right? But like you said, most, I I haven't seen deals where it was just like, we just lost everything. Well, we've seen a couple, but that was totally different circumstances. Isolated. Yes, situations. isolated situations. I mean, we're talking, it's actually built, it's done right, everything else. Um, there, most of these people, there are options because the market's still there. And uh, I think that when you look at a lot of the stuff, especially with debt, it shows though the risk of the short-term fluctuations. And uh, also, I think making knee jerk reactions instead of planning out. And like you said, work with your lender. There are options. There are strategies. Get behind it. Work through it. Right. And see how the market's uh, playing out over the next. I I think the next busy season is going to be better 
than this one was. And I think it might even be significantly better because we've had two slow seasons now where we're washing out, right? And that's a big difference. You go from two slow seasons, right, to a, a slow, busy season. You're changing the overall supply in the market. You're changing the competitors. They're changing the pricing. The Like when we went into last busy season, it was all over the place. Nobody knew. We didn't know. It was like, and we had some facilities where we're like, I don't know, just drop the price to nothing. We, we don't know where the market's at. That's not true today. We actually know where the market's at, even moving into the slow season. We can see a floor on rates where they are. Now, they may not be good. We may not like them, right? But it's not like it was last uh, spring or early summer. That means the marketplace can actually look at things. They can make decisions, right? Uh, and so I think that right now, the people that are actually in it, getting things done, the hurdle is the obligation of those loan payments. If you're trying to get in the game, what would you suggest for structure? What are you looking for? What are you asking? Let's say you have a, a, a deal. It's a good deal. Like there's meat on that bone. There's good cash flow. It's at a decent price now. Cap rates we've seen come up. What are you going and asking the lenders then? There's options. They're out there. What do you need to be prepared for? What do you need to be like when you're like, if I'm coming to you and you're a lender, what is the lenders in general looking for today? And what should your expectations be? Lenders today are, they want to know, especially this is a situation where somebody's trying to get into the business. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Buy an actual existing into, we're going, I'm going back. Sorry. I'm going back to existing cash flowing assets. Sure. Okay. We're not talking non cash flowing debt. Got You're it. buying it yeah. from a normal seller acquisition cash. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if, if this is an existing facility that's, physically stabilized, economically stabilized, if not close to it, right? I mean, that's th those buckets are, are still very much open across the spectrum of lenders that are interested in it, uh, you know, from life insurance companies to banks, to credit unions, to CMBS guys, right? Those are, you know, the, the main players in that sphere. They're all active and they still really like self-storage. You know, I think really what it boils down to is they're going to look it used to be, you know, people are still sometimes talking about loan to value or debt yields, but it's really just debt coverages is where, where, where this game is played. And that's, you know, for, for the audience, it's, um, it's really your, your net operating income or your net cash flow, depending upon how the lender calculates it divided by, uh, debt payments, right, on an annual basis. So they want to see a certain level there because why do I say that? Some of these markets where if it's trading, for instance, on at a or selling at a 6% cap rate and your your interest rate is say 7%, that isn't there's a negative spread between the two. So the argument that people, you know, there's there's a lot of times negative leverage is thrown around, but we have to be we, we, we should be careful with that with that statement. But you know, effectively what that means is stating that by getting that loan it would chew into your returns rather than buying it all cash. So making sure that the the um the debt coverages are at a specific level, making sure that uh, rates have not bottomed out yet and getting a true competitive set that shows where where things are in the market. I think a lot of impacts that have happened and I've heard a few stories n recently is, you know, some of these with especially with the M&A transactions that are going on on some of the larger ones that have happened over the last year. And in, in these markets where you have larger institutional owners, they can weather the storm. Right. And the uh, the ECRIs, they can just go in at a lower amount and then in increase rates more so than normal. So, you know, just making sure that really looking at supply, you know, I'm, I know I'm, I might not be mentioning anything that's earth shattering here, but to ensure that yes. nobody is coming in yes. to this market that can just build uh, mm -hmm. essentially across the street yep. and just you know, take all market share. So got to be careful about some of those secondary and tertiary markets mm -hmm. in, in these type of 
in, in these type of situations. So really ensuring that the sustainability of this cash flow on an existing basis is 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 good for the long haul. Some of these deals, you know, it, it does make sense to if, if you I know it's harder to do, but if you have all cash, you buy it all cash. Right. Yeah. And you, you ride out the storm that way and then you sort of, hey, I'm we're going to increase value. Well, you know, let's see where the next few months go. Yeah. Okay. Hey, let's lock in a rate. You know, ideally, we, we like to take advantage of flexible prepayment structures, especially for assets that have that. Even if it's a light touch value add, because if you're in some some vehicle that that you can't monetize that, it's you know you're you're gonna have to wait. So you know, just just thinking about all these things, but being a, a lot more uh, understanding of what can impact my cash flows and how can this, you know, not go where we want it to go. I, you know, cutting loans at tight debt coverages is, is pretty tough right now. And what, what is a tight? So when you're looking at debt coverage ratio, sure. what, what are, what are the ranges there and what are they looking at? Cause you, you mentioned it's a uh, net income divided by debt payments on an annual basis. So what are, what does that look like? Sure. So obviously debt pay or the net operating income or net cash flow, however, the lender, uh, determines divided by the loan payments, uh, the numerator, the greater the numerator, obviously ideal. Some, everybody has a different protocol for it, right? There's not one size fits all. Some people, the razor, razor, razor thin that I like, that I would say is like a 125 cover, right? And a lot of times you'll see that maybe with a bank or a credit union. Um, you're not going to really see that with CMBS or a life insurance company, 125 in this market would sort of imply higher leverage. If a CMBS full, uh, lender or a life insurance company is doing that, we're talking fixed rate now, mm -hmm. not floating yeah. rate or anything like that, existing cash flowing assets, they're not gonna cut it. That, that would imply sort of higher leverage for them. And um, that's those lenders more often than not especially CMBS is always non-recourse, non-recourse being there's no personal guarantee. Life insurance companies on larger deals are non-recourse as well. Some of them maybe on the smaller loan amounts won't, but that's too high of leverage for them to be comfortable, all things being equal. But the banks and the credit unions a lot of times have recourse, right? So there is a personal guarantee tied behind it. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're more comfortable with that low debt service coverage ratio because, hey, I'm backed by a warm body who's personally guaranteeing this loan. Rather, a CMBS loan is not. So they need to have some insulation on their debt coverages so that if that numerator, because the debt payment is fixed, yeah. right? The debt payment is fixed and it's always, I mean, more often than not, just make sure you're reading your loan agreement, but it's calculated on an amortizing basis just so they have a, a stable baseline to do it annually. Right. Not if you have a little bit of IO, they're not going to look at an IO. They need to have a continuous test based on a fixed level throughout the duration. But the CMBS loan that, w that we're talking about, that's non recourse. The loan has to sustain the, the, the payments throughout the duration of you can't, they're not, there's, there's no, if, if you, the default is not backed by, uh, you know, the, the, the warm body behind it. It's really yes. the asset. Yes. So they would want more insulation than a 125, which is really, you know, for storage, that's what I generally like to say as a rule of thumb. You know, maybe some other asset classes, it can be tighter, yeah. right? But especially storage is different. Yeah, storage is different, especially if you have, you know, a long-term, if single tenant building, long-term lease, investment grade credit with a tenant like that, annual rent steps, lease goes beyond the duration of the loan. It's a d personally guaranteed by, you know, uh, an investment grade company, different situations. If we had like, let's say that we got a uh, hundred thousand dollars net one versus two. So like, what does that ratio look like as far as debt amount and handling? I mean, we have like 125, right? And but if you went up to two versus one, which is obviously yeah, low, that's a, that's a big that's that would that would be a that would be a huge step, yes. right? So essentially, if you have uh, let's just use simple math, right? If your 
NOI is a hundred dollars and your debt payment is a hundred dollars, right? Yep. So you have a one to one payment. Yes. If your property taxes next year go up by anything, you are negative in all, and you have zero rent growth. Uh, yep. EGI effective gross income is the absolute same number next year. You're underwater. Yep. Right. So basically, your loan amount or your loan payment is higher than the money that you've generated at the facility. If you make a hundred and twenty-five dollars in your net operating income and your loan payment is a hundred dollars, right? Yep. You have a one point two five cover. So. One hundred twenty-five dollars minus a hundred, you are left with twenty-five dollars in your pocket. Yes, right. So two is doubling. Two would be doubling. Yes, right. Yes. So that would be two hundred dollars mm-hmm. to one hundred to one. So obviously, the higher the debt service coverage ratio, yeah. the more comfortable the lender is because they say, even on a stress test, okay, Connor, this property can. Uh, can drop in income by X amount and I'm still fine. You're still making loan payments, right? So that's that's uh, that's the 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 train of thought there. We there's all of these things, right? And we did per, uh, and two, don't be overwhelmed by this. this is discussions you're going to have, and all of these things are um, they are circumstantial. We're talking bank location, sure. right? Parties, everything else. But the these rule of thumbs can help you understand, though, especially when evaluating what you're looking at, your current position, right, or your future, given uh, metrics, targets, where you should be looking at staying out of trouble, right? Or saying, too, I'm not going to get a lender to be lending at this level, right? And as you start to go down in quality and different things like that, they want there, there needs to be more cushion, right? Um, there's a wide degree uh, between downtown LA and Pasigula, Mississippi, right? Sure. Uh, those are, are not the same, same types and products. Now, outside traditional bank things before we end here because um i don't want to take your whole day but um what are other debt products that people are looking at or using so they say i I don't know if i can get a a a traditional bank loan like what what should people be looking at in 2024 who should they be talking to where should they be going another really great question and you know obviously besides you just yeah, calling right, you right right, so, right, yeah, yeah. right 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 call cedar creek capital <laughs> exactly. advisors please um yeah so um you know every like i like i've said before everything is very much deal specific right yes. and and you know deal profile but um Obviously, un- getting ahead of this is, is is really important, right? And we also have to think that, uh, and this came to my mind as as you were just speaking, but you know, with when you have these sort of illiquidity moments, right, where some people maybe pull back or don't want to be doing certain things, then those it, it's like uh, it's like water that flows down and we'll find a a ditch and just fill it up right as as it goes down you know the gutters or whatever it always finds its way into a hole that's exactly what happens with 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 borrowers they always find that that lender who's going to give them the money and then they all sort of pile into that right yep that's exactly what happens so you have to think right if i'm going to propose something to somebody why should they do this when they have 15 other opportunities, you know, they obviously are reporting, the person that you're talking to at that financial institution is reporting to higher ups Mm -hmm. and they have uh, discretion as to where this capital is going. So, hey, do I take this, this 125 loan or do I take the, the two debt coverage loan, right? I'm going to take the one that's least risky, right? Yeah. That, that's my choice. So, you know, when, when you start thinking about that, right, um, it's important to get ahead of this. It ta- it still is taking a little bit longer than than normal to to execute on some of these deals to get it right. Having all your financials in order. Some of the other avenues that that people can look at. There's always there there's that you know that unicorn seller financing. It does work. 
it, it really does work. And I think the topic, not sure if we're going to get onto it uh, on this session, but, you know, some folks are able to potentially pay a little bit more for properties by proposing a seller financing structure that's undercutting what banks or credit unions can do, right? Because yeah. if your borrowing costs are lower, then you can potentially, hey, pay a market price or above market price, whatever we deem as market, right? So so seller financing is one. There's, you know, there's there's new folks that are always coming into the space on, on the private lending sphere or the non-bank type side, right? For for some of these asset types, right? Especially those that are in lease up or value add deals. But as I mentioned before, a, a lot of the players who who are active or who who historically were active are still active, right? Yeah. Maybe there it's just more selective in what they're doing. So I think you need to be prepared with potentially more equity. Um, your underwriting pencil needs to be sharper. Um, oh. You need to just, if, if you need to give recourse where maybe historically you didn't to bolster the, the credit enhancement or the credit worthiness of the deal, think about it. Yeah. Just think of structures that that will get people comfortable and, and will get them, you also, know. Also, um, partners that can come on to sure. help you sure. to get that liquidity that can sign on the dotted line. Um, uh, there, you know, what do you th uh, think about uh, local banks, credit unions versus bigger banks? What have you been seeing in the banking world, the separation of banks, have you seen an appetite at one level versus another more so? Especially over the last year, the, the local banks and credit unions have stepped up a lot more, especially in the self-storage sphere, right? The thing with storage is that, and the stats I know are way more at your fingertips than mine, but the the large majority is is really smaller deals, right? Yes, under, absolutely. you know, under, call it, let's just say sub- 15 million, sub 10 million, yeah. even, right? That's got to be 80%. Yeah. So th those deals in a lot of these large, larger, the national uh, banking institutions, that, 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 that's too small for them to mm -hmm. to want to get involved with. So that's really where, you know, and especially with CMBS pricing over the last, storage always finds itself into, it finds itself a lot of times into CMBS. I'm not, I, I used to be a CMBS lender. And for those that have never borrowed there, I'm not necessarily saying go out and do it because it's a, it's a, different process, yeah. but it's it's very much, it fits nicely with self-storage because storage in and of itself is low touch. There's no TIs, tenant improvements, there's no LCs, leasing commissions or anything like that. So it's, it's a very, you know, rent rolls are very granular. You don't have big blocks of rollover that need to be factored into, you know, for, for, for their loan underwriting. But, um, yeah, with, with those loan coupons just blowing out over the last year, a lot people didn't want to pay seven plus percent on their money or, or on, on their loans. So they were going to local banks and they were still getting maybe high fives into the sixes at that time, right? And they're saying, okay, well, yeah, what's the trade-off between the two? Okay, I don't get as much interest only. I have to sign recourse, but you know what? I have maybe flexible prepay and let's wait for the market to calm down and I can get out of this loan and do something else. So those local banks and local credit unions, I'm I'm an advocate of. Some of the credit unions are, you know, credit unions are really particular as are the banks, but you know, you, a lot of them have criteria that say asset sponsor need to be in this market, uh, ownership needs to have, you know, nobody, anybody in excess of, X percent needs to sign on the loan agreements or needs to be a guarantor. So they can, you know, they they can have particulars about them. And also, especially earlier this year with some of the banking uh, situation with some of the failures of the banks and the run on deposits, a lot of these banks will say, hey, I'd love to work with you. Can I have some deposits? I mean, that, yep. you know, yep. that that tends to go a, a a long way, um, and I and I tell people to to truly consider it, especially if you can get into, you know, even if it's some of these CDs, the certificates of deposits, yep. or the money market is paying you five percent. It's like okay, just you can park yep. something there, and you're getting a little return on that money, and it allows you access to to yes. to their their loans. Yes, That's do a really good idea. Now you also too, I think um, one thing, and Ben's mentioned this. 
multiple times and i think i you know really i i want to leave everybody with this is that a, a lot of people think oh i can either i'm either like either bankable or lendable meaning that they believe i can either get a loan or i can't from a bank and that's not how it works we have to go to tons of banks we had one deal where we went to like a hundred banks you're trying to find a good match with a good product and that goes on both sides so don't expect to walk into your local bank and say hey will you give me and if they say no that means you're not you can't get a loan or not bankable it, there's banking on commercial real estate it is like you said they are a partner you're putting yep. things together so yep. now listening to that i know that sounds vastly overwhelming and that is why we have ben that's what ben does at cedar at cedar Creek capital advisors that's literally what he does it he goes out and he places debt right and that's what he does for us and what, like i said we had one deal he went over a hundred banks and it is um it, it's a it's a process right because each one is different you got to find the right thing for both people so if it is overwhelming you guys just reach out uh, talk to us and we can see if we can help you out there. But don't be discouraged by it is what I'm saying, right? So don't be discouraged because your first option, this isn't a house. It's not a product that's a 30-year mortgage. Here's the exact specific requirements. You either are approved or not based upon you. Um, and that's that's a big piece that I know people can be either discouraged about. I don't think a bank will give me money because whatever reason, right? It doesn't work like that in commercial real estate. So it is actually one of the best things about commercial real estate that we can do that. But um, all right. I know we've taken so much of your time, Ben, but you, the knowledge here and the depth, especially after everything that's gone on this year, it, thank you. Thanks for coming on here and explaining, you know, what are complicated things and, and especially in a market that changes wildly. Think about guys, go back and listen to, you know, two years ago, the podcast on debt and things that we're talking about mm -hmm. compared to now different world totally right it's wild. so it's wild totally, totally wild. wild and um guess what two years it'll be different again so exactly keep listening everybody thanks ben thank you thanks guys so it was great